Let's take a look at the solutions to the Chapter 4 Multiple Choice. Number one, when we take a census, we attempt to collect data from... Uh, the correct answer here is going to be every individual in the population because that is a definition of a census. A couple things to be cautious of here. A stratified random sample. This is done when we have an observational study, and it's like blocking, but keep in mind, stratified samples are for observations. Blocking is when you take an experiment. A letter B, every individual chosen in a simple random sample. Uh, that would be from just a sample and obviously not a census. A voluntary response sample are those only that choose to respond if a survey is given to them. And a convenient sample is taking a sample in an um, easy location and the people that we end up sampling are just the ones that are there. For example, a shopping mall is a good example of that. Number two, you want to take a simple random sample, or an SRS, of 50 of the 816 students who live in a dormitory on campus. You label the students 001 to 816 in alphabetical order. In the table of random digits, you read the entries listed right here. The first three students in your samples are which labels? One of the things to keep in mind here is our desired population is 816 students. Because we're picking from a population in the hundreds, like a three position, you must, in your sample, have three positions in your digits. So if you just said from 1 to 816, that would be incorrect. You must say from 001. When you go through and you actually pick the correct sample, you're going to end up seeing that it's going to be letter E. Walking through that, the first one is 955, which we don't have that number. Uh, 929, we don't. The next one we do have is 400. Then we have 769. Uh, we have another 769, but in this case, these are individual students, so repeats would not make sense, so that one does not in get included. And then the next one would be 335. One of the things here to note is sometimes repeats do make sense, but because every student is labeled with an individual number, uh, getting another individual at 769 would be the same person. So here, again, repeats don't make sense. Number four, a study of treatments for angina, pain due to low supply to the heart, compared bypass surgery, angioplasty, and the use of drugs. The study looked at the medical records of thousands of angina patients whose doctors had chosen one of these treatments. It found that the average survival time of patients given drugs was the highest. What do you conclude? The correct answer here is going to be D, and the key is this. Uh, we cannot conclude that drugs prolong life because this was an observational study. If an experiment was not imposed in this case, you can never make a conclusion about any of the so-called treatments that were given. Uh, these treatments were not randomly assigned. They were just observing what people had chosen to do as their particular treatment. If we look at the other answers, uh, letter A does have a, a major issue with the word choice. Uh, here they say that the drug proves this. Um, in statistics, I can't think of a time I've heard the word proved used. Um, that is more of a calculus type of, of terminology. Here, we all can only make conclusions. Uh, letter B, we can conclude that drugs prolong life because the study was a comparative experiment. This was not an experiment. A treatment was not randomly assigned to anyone. Uh, we can't conclude that drugs prolong life because the patients were volunteers. Uh, volunteers would be fine. That's just going to define who our population is. Um, again, if an experiment had been imposed, it would be different. In letter E, we cannot conclude drugs prolong life because no placebo was used. Um, in this case, we're really just looking at three different treatments, um, and we don't necessarily need to have a placebo um, if a true experiment or assignment of the treatments was truly decided and uh, applied. Question four, a simple random sample, SRS, is what? The definition here is going to be C. A sample that gives every possible sample of the same size the same chance to be selected. So basically, every single possible outcome has to be available to, ha to happen. Um, if something is being controlled in a specific way that it can't, then it would not be considered a simple random sample. Uh, letter A, a sample selected by using chance. That's kind of what we're doing, but again, we have to be more specific. B, any sample that gives every individual the same chance to be selected. You know, if our sample size was one, I guess this would be a true statement, but it's that 
uh, the possible sample sizes that we're looking for, every one of those outcomes has to be possible. Uh, letter D, a sample doesn't involve strata or clusters. Um, that would be false. You can have a strata or clusters um, are going to happen when we're doing an observational study. Um, when we create this, the strata or the clusters, though, we have to be able to have our possible um, ways of creating those samples such that various strata and clusters are possible, which really is kind of still a simple random sample. Letter E, a sample that is generated to be representative of the population. Um, this really is just an example of a cluster, by the way, uh, which would be um, similar to what a, a mini population would look like. Question five, consider an experiment to investigate the effectiveness of different insecticides in controlling pests and their impact on the productivity of tomato plants. What is the best reason for randomly assigning treatments levels, which are spraying or not spraying, to the experimental units, which are our farms? Here, letter B is going to be the correct answer. Um, and the best reason for this is that random assignment will tend to average out all other uncontrolled factors, such as soil fertility, so they are not confounded with the treatment effects. Now, why is A not applicable? This would say random assignment makes the experiment easier to conduct since we can apply the insecticides in any pattern. It's not about the easiness of doing it. Uh, letter C, random assignment makes the analysis easier since the data can be collected. I actually, we're talking about easier again. It's not about the analysis being easier or the experiment being easier. Letter D, random assignment is required by statistical consultants before they will help you analyze the experiment. Well, if they're a good statistical consultant, I suppose that, that they would say, if it's not randomly done, I'm not going to look at it, but it's not required. Uh, e, random assignment implies that it is not necessary to be careful during the experiment, during data collection and during analysis. Well, you do want to be careful when you set up your experiment. You have to be thoughtful and design it in such a way um, to control possible confounding variables. So just because you randomly assign doesn't guarantee it's going to be well done. The entire experiment needs to be thoughtful and set up properly. Number six, the most important advantage of experiments over observational studies is that B is the correct answer here. Experiments can, be, uh, can give better evidence of causation. The only time you, make, you can make cause and effect uh, conclusions is when an experiment has happened, and that means that a treatment has been randomly assigned. If you're doing an observational study, you can never, ever make uh, cause and effect conclusions for that. It has nothing to do with letter A, that experiments are usually easier to carry out. Uh, letter B, confounding cannot happen in experiments. It can if you don't control for that. So if you don't design your experiment properly, confounding can happen. Uh, D, an observational study, cannot have a response variable. They absolutely have a response variable. You're going to measure the outcome in an observational study. That is the response variable. In E, observational studies cannot use random samples. We absolutely can use random samples in observational studies. The only thing an observational study says is a treatment was not randomly assigned to it. Number seven, a TV station wishes to obtain information on the TV viewing habits in its market area. The market area contains one city of population 170,000, another city of 70,000, and four towns of about 5,000 inhabitants each. The station suspects that the viewing habits may be different in larger and smaller cities and in rural areas. Which of the following sampling designs would give the type of information that the station requires? The best answer here is going to be letter D. Now, one thing they're not doing is imposing a treatment. This is an observational study. So the things related to that, um, observational, it could be a cluster, um, it could be a convenient sample, it could be a random sample, it could be stratified. Um, and it also could be an online poll. So these are all observational. Uh, a stratified sample from cities and towns in the market area is gonna be your best bet because they are different types of groups. Um, this could be one strata, another strata, and then our other strata would be the towns of uh, 5,000. You would then put them in different groups based on their town or city size. A cluster means that you're going to make uh, many populations. Um, and so in this case, if we take all of these people and randomly assign it, 
we're not going to really, we could see a mini population, but because these are so distinctly different, clusters make more sense. A convenient sample it means we're going to survey the people that are easiest to get to and not necessarily the best thing here. A simple random sample would be the whole market. And an online polling would be biased too because of those uh, responders would only be those who are online. Um, and that really doesn't have anything to do with this right now. Number eight, bias in sampling method is considered to be by definition letter D. It's any systematic error that tends to occur in the same direction whenever you use the sampling method. One of the things about bias, I will tell you, if you are doing a free response in this chapter and they ask you to explain the bias, you must say what it is and they want to know in what direction the bias happens and that is it overstating or understating your um, results. Number nine, you wonder if TV ads are more effective when they are longer or repeated more often or both. So you did not design an experiment. You prepare 30 second and 60 second ads for a camera. Your subjects all watch the same TV program, but you assign them at random to four groups. One group sees 30 seconds ads during the program. Another sees it three times. The third group sees the 60 second ad once, and the last group sees this, the 60 second ad three times. You ask all subjects how likely they are to buy the camera. Of the options listed here, the one that makes the most sense is that this is letter D. It's a completely randomized design with two explanatory variables. The two explanatory variables, be careful, are going to be your 30 second commercial or your 60 second commercials. So in this case, there's two factors. But within each factor, there's two different types of treatments. So on this one, be careful, there's not four explanatory variables. There's only two different unique ways they're doing it. However, you can either have it uh, one 30 second commercial or three of those, or one 60 second or three of those. So there's two treatments within each type of explanatory variable or factor. For letter A, it says here is a randomized block design but not matched pairs, and for B says it's matched pairs. Um, it's neither of these two. A block design is you're going to kind of group them into like groups. Uh, we don't have like groups of watchers. We don't have like a group of men and a group of women or teenagers and older people. Um, so they are just keeping them all random. Uh, match pairs would be a similar form of blocking, but you would either do it for one person and look at two treatments, or you would look at two different people and match them up. So it's not that. And we already talked about it's not one explanatory variable and it's not four. Question 10. A researcher wishes to compare the effects of two fertilizers on the yield of soybeans. She has 20 plots of land available for the experiment and she decides to use matched pairs design with 10 pairs of plots. To carry out the random assignment for this design, the researcher should. The correct response here was letter B. The best way to do this is um, to subjectively divide the 20 plots into 10 pairs, making the plots within a pair as similar as possible. Then, for each, flip a coin to assign the fertilizer to the two plots. Now, letter A is not a good option because it says use a table of random numbers to divide the 20 plots into 10 pairs. Matched pairs, you actually want to put them into pairs in a purposeful way, so this is not a good method. You do not randomly do that. Letter C, use a, a table of random numbers to divide the 20 plots into 10 pairs again. Again, you do not randomly assign your pairs. You strategically do that. Letter D, flip a coin to divide the 20 pot, plots. Again, this is not randomly done. Letter E, use a table of random numbers to assign two fertilizers to the 20 plots. Then use the table of random numbers a second time to place the plots into 10 pairs. So the issue here is they're still trying to use randomness to put the pairs together. The only one that makes logical sense here is B, which is truly correct. Number 11, you want to know the opinions of American high school teachers on the issue of establishing a national proficiency test as a prerequisite for graduation from high school. You obtain a list of all high school teachers belonging to the National Education Association, uh, the country's largest teacher union, and mail a survey to a random sample of 2,500 teachers. In all, 1,347 of the teachers return their survey. Of those who respond, 32% say they favor some kind of national proficiency test. 
which of the following statement about the situation is true? The best answer here is going to be D. Uh, the result of this survey may be affected by non-response bias. Uh, we must be careful. This survey was mailed, so not everyone is even required to take it. Uh, there definitely is going to be some non-response bias in here. Um, people who did not reply, how would they feel? Again, remember if this was a free response, if we are talking bias as a free response, the AP board wants to know in what direction would this bias be? In other words, would this 32% be overstated or understated? Uh, letter E is not the right answer. The result of the survey cannot be trusted due to voluntary response bias. Well, it's not that it can't be trusted. It is an observational type of survey. We just need to know that it was more of a voluntary response and have that documented. Uh, to be trusted or not, we need to use it with our own caution. Letter C, because over half of those who were mailed the survey actually responded, we can feel pretty confident that the actual percent of all American high school teachers, that's the problem right there. We cannot make a conclusion about all the high school teachers because they all did not respond to this. Uh, there definitely is non-response bias. Letter B, we cannot trust these results because the, the survey was mailed. Is it the best type of survey? No, it, it could be better, but just knowing that we're doing like this observational survey or response, we have to be uh, a thoughtful statistician and realize there could be bias with those results. Letter A, since random sampling was used, we can feel confident that the percent of all American high school teachers uh, would favor the proficiency. Um, again, we, this is an observational study. Only those people that responded um, or those uh, to this survey is what we can make the conclusions about, so we can't say anything about all of them.